Um, but if you see it. So, good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Wirral Strategic Plans Planning Applications Subcommittee. My name is Stuart Kelly and I'm the chair of the committee. This meeting will be webcast and a record retained on the council website. For people at home viewing the webcast, if you look above the meeting, you will see a resources tab. Select this and a link to the agenda will appear on the right hand side. This will enable you to open the agenda reports as PDF. My role is to ensure the meeting runs smoothly, having regards to procedure, behaviour and ethics. To explain who are with us, planning officers, a highway engineer and an environmental health officer. They will present the application and provide any technical advice that may be required. The council solicitor, who will give advice on any procedural or legal matters that may arise. There's also the clerk and IT support. The elected members will consider the application and collectively make the decision. Voting will be by show of hands. The application will be introduced by the planning officers and I will then invite a representative of the qualifying petition to address us, followed by a representative of the written letters of support. I will then invite the applicant to address us. Statutory consultees and the ward councillor will also address the committee. Once all representations have been made and following any questions of clarification from members, speakers may not participate in any debate that follows within the committee. The application will then be open to debate and discussion by members and we will then make a decision on the application. When making their decisions, members must have regard to the provisions of the Planning and Compulsory Repairs Act, which requires decision makers to only have regard to material planning considerations. Members must also have regard to local planning policies and to the national planning policy framework and guidance. The National Framework makes a presumption in favour of sustainable development. Paragraph 11 requires approval of development proposals that accord with an up-to-date development plan without delay, unless the adverse impacts of doing so would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits when assessed against policies in the framework taken as a whole. It's a matter for each member individually to balance any material considerations and decide what weight to give them. Members must not predetermine any matter that comes to the committee for decision. However, it is permissible for members to be predisposed toward a particular outcome with regard to the application, provided they haven't made up their minds on how to vote before formally considering the application detail, listening to the presentations and the debate. Members must have listened to the debate and considered all the facts before deciding whether or not to move a motion. If a member is minded to, to, to put forward a motion, it's good practice to first seek advice from officers on the wording of a potential motion. Members are reminded to use their microphones when speaking. So, to the agenda then. First item is apologies for uh, absence, and we have Sam, Sam for Brian, uh, in, um, uh, as a member. Agenda item two, members' code of conduct, declarations of interest. Members of the committee are asked whether they have any personal or prejudicial interests in connection with the application on the agenda, and if so, to declare it and state the nature of the interest. Are we okay? Excellent. Okay, so uh, agenda item three, West Kirby, Marine Lake, South Parade, West Kirby. If we can invite the planning officers to introduce the item for us, please. Thank you, Chair, through you, Chair. Could I have slide number one, please? Thank you. This application before members has received over 220 comments of, of objection and 23 comments of support. In addition, an e-petition has been submitted, which, as of today, contained 1,102 signatures against the proposal. The objections can be grouped into three themes. The proposal is too costly and not necessary. The design has, been detriment has a detrimental impact on the character of and tourism of the area, and other issues which are outlined in the report. There have been two objections from the Wirral Society and an objection from um, SEDEF, which is addressed in the, in the third um, addendum attached uh, to the report. In terms of support for the proposal, these can be summarised as 
The proposal will provide a much needed protection and renovation for the area. The scheme is well thought out and has been amended in line following comments from the public. Minimising flood risk is more important than views. The application site comprises of approximately one and a half kilometres of promenade along the frontage at West Kirby. Could I have slide number two, please? The site can be divided into three distinct areas. Area one is Riversdale Road to D Lane. And slide number three, please. Area two is D Lane to West, Cur West Kirby Sailing Club. Sli slide four, please. And area three is West Kirby Sailing Club. Can I have slide five, please? Under current predictions for flooding from the sea, the, stand the standard in event is 0.5% likelihood in one year. This means that for West Kirby, 70 homes are at risk from flooding now and, and a further 540 homes are at risk with sea level rises in the next 100 years. This information is based on DEFRA's guidance. Could I have slide number six, please? In relation to the planning application, the, the key proposals um, in, relation to this, in, in relation to flood protection are a 1.2 metre high flood wall covering 1.5 metres um, from Riversdale Road in the north to Sandy Lane in the south. The wall will contain 13 pedestrian access points and five vehicle access points, which can be closed before flood events. Wraps around the sailing centre will provide flood protection in line with planning conditions. Slide number eight, please. Looking at the de detail of the scheme, the proposed 1.2 metre high flood defence wall will include seating and will incorporate floodgates. The memorial plaques um, that are on the seating currently in West Kirby will be uh, relocated onto the, onto the proposed new wall. Number, slide number nine, please. The proposed wall will be located 1.2 metres from the car parking spaces at its closest point. This will allow for car doors to open easily and for prams and wheelchairs um, to gain access to, to, the, to the promenade. Now, slide number 10, please. The mim minimum width of the promenade will be 3.3 metres at, um, at its minimum. And because the, the wall is curved, it'll be 3.8 metres at its maximum um, point. If you think about the path that goes round the lake currently, this measures two and a half metres in width. So the um, proposed width of the, of the promenade will be, will be greater than that. That's slide number 11, please. In terms of the key issues um, in, relation, in relation to this, to this proposal, the in terms of the programme, this accounts for noise and disturbance to the de estuary bird populations. It minimises impact on the local economy by, um, completing one phase, by be, being completed in one phase. And the main construction activity will be between April and September to protect um, the bird, winter bird breeding um, situation. There'll be no lo net loss of parking provision on South Parade. All cycling options are considered and, and a single direct lane is incorporated within the proposals. Curvilinear features addresses provides passing spaces for wheelchairs, There'll be an increase in seating provision. There's a greater focus on amenity, walking and health benefits. There'll be ramped access to the water space and increased open space at the old bath site. Existing dedications on benches will be incorporated and the Victorian features, including the shelters, railings and seawall, will be retained and refurbished. The public rain will be upgraded from the, from the 1980s concrete paving and the proposal will protect life and property from flooding and allows the highway to remain open during flood events. Now, slide number 12, please. The key issues to assess um, in relation to this proposal are, are covered in the report and are, and are considered to be the, princ the principle of the development is considered to be acceptable subject to the requirements of both local and national planning policy guidance. The assessments are set out in the report and in in attached to the addendum number two. In terms of coastal protection, UDP po P policy CO4 um, confirms that proposals for new coastal protection and sea defence works will be permitted. But the main criteria is to ensure that works are necessary to protect life, existing built development and fixed capital assets which cannot be located inland. In relation to the impact of the proposals on the immunity of surrounding occupiers, the scheme is designed to protect properties at risk from flooding both now and in the future. 
With regard to highway um, implications, the proposal includes resurfacing um, the current highway, which will be undertaken along the re including realigning the road. Parking re will remain as is, and a new cycle lane is proposed, which will run north to south. In order to assess the impact of the proposal on ecology in the area, a Habitats Regs assessment has been undertaken, and this has been assessed by Natural England as a statutory consultee. They have confirmed that the proposal will not have a detrimental impact on habitats in this part of the SSSI. In relation to design of the scheme, the data, details of which are I have outlined earlier, the proposal has been through two rounds of public consultation, and the result of these events form this planning application submission. The height of the wall has resulted in a number of objections to the scheme. However, a wall at a lower height will not meet the required level of protection from um, tidal flooding and the national standards for assessment at risk. In relation to the economic benefits, the applicants have highlighted research undertaken by Wire Council into the associated financial benefits of a similar scheme. This research has shown that improvements to the public realm has a potential to boost the visitor economy. I have slide 13, please. The cost of the scheme has also be, been raised by a number of, of objectors. Grant funding can be considered to be a material consideration along with other factors. Um, in this instance, We've got a flood, there's a flood, flood advance grant of £2,164,000, a partnership funding from Wirral Council of £2,378,000, and other government department um, monies of well, nearly uh, £100,000. A million pounds, sorry, I beg your pardon. Um, can I have slide 14, please? In summary, it's considered that the pro proposal will prevent coastal flooding, flooding, which will protect lives and property. The design will change West Kirby Promenade, but will provide a new public realm for res residents and visitors to enjoy. There will be no loss of parking, and, and cycle provi provision will be enhanced. There will be access for all unit users. Ecological impacts have been addressed and can be controlled via conditions. The proposal is considered to comply with both the National Planning Policy Framework and the relevant UDP policies. And the proposal is therefore recommended for approval, subject to the attached conditions. Okay, thanks for, for that. Okay, so we'll now hear from the um, lead petitioner. So, if Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark. Yes, turn it on and we can we'll communicate. Okay, thank okay. you. So, so you, you're able to speak on behalf of the lead petitioners of objection. Um, normally at our committee meetings when we, we, we hear um, uh, presentations, uh, we try and suggest five minutes um, will be an appropriate um, time. But I, I don't want to interrupt your flow. I appreciate this is a big uh, application with a number of of aspects. So I'll, I'll give you an indication when you're at five minutes and, and, and maybe you, then you could give us an indication about how, how, how much further <laughs> you yeah. might have to go if that's... Uh, okay, thank you Chair. I appreciate okay. that. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the clock as well here. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening in consideration of this application. Uh, the opportunity to speak to yourselves as um, decision makers this evening. Um, so the message is very clear. You are considering an application that has received 223 objections and a petition based on extremely rational grounds that has over 1,100 signatories. Please do not destroy the special character of West Kirby Promenade. Please do not harm the enjoyment of thousands upon thousands of residents, visitors and their families who enjoy the openness and sea views provided by the promenade. Please specifically consider those with access to mobility issues who will no longer be able to pass on the wavy 1.2 to 1.7 metre footway that will be created to the rear of the proposed flood wall. And I'll pick on, on that critical point some more in a moment. In your decision making, you should note and consider the very reasons why the promenade was originally built some 120 years ago. The promenade as we see it today, very much in the same form as it exists today, was created via the Hoylake and West Kirby uh, improvement Bill, and it was approved by the House of Commons in November 1896, 1896, and I quote, to provide for fresh air, sea views, and a sense of openness to be enjoyed by all. 
Um, those reasons are as valid today, if not more valid today, than they ever have been, and surely you must, you must agree with this. To be clear, this is not an objection against flood protection or any kind of denial around climate change. In fact, quite the opposite, and the Council should be commended in its commitment in time and effort today in securing environment energy monies and allocating a further £2 million of its own funds towards this cause, um, noting this is all public money. I also appreciate the significant worry and disruption to residents of the nine residential properties and four businesses that have suffered damage to date and support them in the need to find solutions to prevent this from happening again. Again, the Council Environment Agency should be commended in action taken since uh, this disruption, and that does seem to be working, including road closures and a flood warning system that I understand is now in, now in place. Um, this is an objection against the current design solution proposed that will cause very significant harm. It will impose a 1.2 metre high concrete wall along 1.15 kilometres of West Kirby Promenade. Uh, it will harm the openness of the promenade, prejudice coastal views and reduce the width of the promenade by a third. Uh, significantly, it will change the distinctiveness of this historic Victorian promenade and it will disadvantage and discriminate specific user groups and breach the Equality Act. And again, I'll come on to that point in a moment. I would also point out that perversely, the proposal does not in fact meet environmental agency standards which advises an AOD of 7.17 metres, whereby this proposal only proposes an AOD of 7.0 metres. Um, to be absolutely clear, there are other solutions and options along with scope and or along with scope to significantly finesse the current scheme to provide a much more preferable and less harmful solution. I could give a range of solutions that would include the use of topography, existing walls, structures uh, uh, that e exist today. There are long sections of the promenade where we're effectively building a wall in front of a wall. That just does not seem to make any sense, in, any sense to me. Nonetheless, I appreciate the committee must decide on the proposal in front of them, which, regardless of alternatives, is not acceptable. The Council's own report suggests that the closure of South Parade some 25 times over recent years, and no doubt they were linked to high tides and events that, that were predictable. Um, my understanding is that the Council currently manage the closure of, of the road at, at high tides, and as I mentioned a moment ago, that does seem to be proving successful in, reduce, in reducing harm. But by com comparison, I would ask how many times has the M53 Telegraph Road or Mal's Drive closed over that same period of time? I would hazard a guess that it would be 25 times or more by comparison. Um, uh, there are very clear planning grounds as to why this application cannot be approved, and there's also a significant, very, very significant highway safety matter that does not appear to have been given significant credence within the report. I'm perplexed as to why there is no highways objection to the creation of a 1.2 metre wide footway, albeit, I accept, extending to 1.7 metres, running 1.15 kilometres along the promenade. Uh, this, is, this is so clearly a highway safety issue um, that falls well below of a raft of national standards and advice and guidance on the width of footways, the proposed footway being only 1.2 metres in width along, along its length. Department for Transport Inclusive Mobility Guidance of pavement width states a clear width of 2,000 millimetres or two metres to allow two wheelchairs to pass one another comfortably. This should be regarded as a minimum on the normal circumstances where this is not possible because of physical constraints, 1,500 millimetres or 1.5 metres could be regarded as the minimum acceptable in most circumstances, giving sufficient space for wheelchairs and walkers to pass one another. As an absolute minimum, uh, if there's an obstacle, it should be no, no, no thinner than 1,000 millimetres or one metre, but note that should not be over a greater distance than six metres. In this instance, we are talking about 1.2 metres along 1.15 kilometres. Uh, to go further, I believe that improving this application, the Council will be in breach of the Section 149 of the Equality Act 2010, which places duties on local authorities to have due regard to, to the need to eliminate unlawful discrimination and advance equality of opportunity between people who share a protected characteristic. The Real Traffic Management Network Plan pledges that the High Wheel Authority must consider the needs of anyone with protected characteristics as per the Equality Act, or making any changes to our road network, accessibility requirements apply to temporary measures they do to permanent ones. The proposal should be removed or withdrawn by the councils as the applicant on the basis of very clear conflict with the Equality Act. Uh, for reference, a wheelchair or pushchair is around 76 centimetres wide. Two users could not pass uh, uh, via, uh, 
uh, via the proposed 1.2 to 1.7 metre footway. In addition, uh, frequent visitors coming by and families visiting by car, the proposed solution simply will not work and it is a significant highway safety risk. In fact, a local restaurant was refused a temporary pavement licence on the basis of highway objection, whereby the footway would have, would have been reduced to 1.5 metres in width over a 12 metre length on the basis it would force users into the road. Yet we have a thinner 1.2 metre footway over 1.15 kilometres. You, you've had about six minutes. Yeah, so okay. I'll, 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 I'll round up then. Okay, so in, 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 the, in the committee report, uh, it references a number of uh, policies within the UDP against which you may, must make your decision. My opinion is there is clear conflict in, against a number of those policies, yet the committee report appears to gloss over those. Uh, with policy to land one, land two, uh, and the list goes on, it consistently talks about character, views, setting, and harm, and yet they, they seem to be ignored. In addition, I would ask why the report does not make reference to policy TL1 and the protection of urban tourist resorts. Um, okay, and then um, also I would point out the, the report contains three summaries of decision. I would just ask for clarification against which one it is that we are, we are deciding. So to conclude, um, to, to members of the committee, you must appreciate this proposal will ruin West Kirby Promenade. Alternative solutions can be found. A consultation has taken place. Please listen. Uh, I fully respect this is a planning committee, a material planning t and in ma material planning in terms, terms, this scheme is not acceptable against a number of policies within the adopted UDP against which you must make your decision. The application should therefore be refused and I would encourage the Council to, to look for alternative solutions that would be acceptable. Thank you, Chair. Thanks for that. I'm, I'm just going to ask if any members have any questions of clarification at this point. I appreciate there was a number of issues which members might want to direct to our officers later. Uh, we'll, we'll reach that as members later. But, uh, uh, Steve? A very uh, easy one. Uh, it, 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 didn't introduce yourself, your name, and what capacity are you at the local residence? Or yeah, so my name's Anthony Clark. I'm a, a, a local resident. I live in close proximity to the promenade, um, and yeah, long-standing resident. So I'm here in that capacity. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, any other questions, Kath? It's one chair, which is to the officers in relation to the equal opportunities. Um, I think, I think we'll probably pick that up when we, so we listen to all the presentations, we, we've made, no doubt we've made some notes and uh, I, I, think, I think I saw our highways officer making notes and we'll, we'll probably expect us to, uh, to seek some advice on, on, on some of the things that are being said, but if we, if we listen to all the presentations first, that'd be great. And any further questions? Or, uh, Mr. Clark, thank you very much okay, for... Thank, for thank you for the additional time, thank you committee. Okay, no problem. Um, okay, um, as members will be aware, there were um, significant numbers of letters of support, um, and we've been, we were contacted uh, this week by a, um, a, a, a resident asking to uh, address the uh, committee in support. Um, unfortunately, he's now taken ill but has, um, has given a statement uh, and asked for it to be read out, which is a, a facility that we've, um, uh, we've extended to applicants, agents, uh, and others uh, in the past. So I'm proposing that we, uh, that we do that. And again, we, uh, we ask the solicitor just to, uh, to read out what Mr. Goodchild um, has, has to say to us. So this is from the, um, a statement from the Letters of Support. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, so uh, this is a letter from John T. Uh, Goodchild, um, a local uh, resident. Um, he, he gives his apologies for not being able to uh, attend due to illness, as the Chair's outlined. Um, he states, we are fully aware that uh, in any uh, planning application, the number of objections always significantly outweighs the number of supporting comments, as it is the public's perception of the planning system in the UK. It's generally deemed that, there's the, the, uh, that that is the responsibility of the applicant um, or the planning application to argue the case for the development and the public to register objections. And as is the case here, this often results in a large number of objections. Consequently, in light of this, we are very grateful to have the opportunity of putting forward a voice 
for the many who support this proposal. My wife and I have lived on South Parade for some time, and we have witnessed firsthand the destruction and distress caused by recent flood events, something which many objectors will not have experience of. We have witnessed cars being picked up and smashed through retaining walls of property gardens, allowing the water free access beyond. We have witnessed water seeping through front doors of people's property in flood events and unfortunately have witnessed the distress, worry and effect on people's health as a result. We have seen several cars totally engulfed in water which have been left unknowingly on the prom, which have been destroyed and also have witnessed the power of the waves actually moving vehicles around, which weigh several tonnes, which end up battering rams, destroying property. Damage to property and people's way of life is a real concern to us as is people's safety in such flood events. People often refer to the, uh, the 2013 flood event, but we have witnessed many more since then. Climate warming and extreme weather and storm events are increasing and will continue to do so in the future. As politicians and leaders of countries from across the glo globe gather at the COP26 climate summit, there is now no longer an argument against this. It's happening and this is now categoric. Consequently, there is no longer an argument against the fact that the West Kirby Promenade is going to flood more regularly and the town, people's property and businesses, livelihoods and continued use of their family homes to be passed down to future generations need protecting from this. It's not just the next few years which we refer to, it's the long term, the next 50 years or more. In our opinion, one cannot put a price on this, but we have a wonderful opportunity granted to us by the Environment Agency by way of the grant which has been offered. West Kirby has been identified by them as one of a very few high-risk areas which needs their intervention. We must accept their professional experts. None of us are qualified to do anything other than this, and we should also accept their funds to allow us to protect West Kirby and its residents and economy without the need to fund the works completely out of the Council's budget. This may be our only chance to secure such funding, and the opportunity needs to be taken and taken now to prevent a more costly remedy to this increasing problem in the future. In our opinion, this prom is looking a little tired and scruffy and does not do the town justice. West Kirby is an important tourist destination and the new wall along with a completely new promenade walkway with seats will undoubtedly become a tourist attraction. I have heard it argued that if the proposal goes ahead it will reduce the number of visitors to West Kirby. There is absolutely no evidence to suggest this. Why would visitors not come to West Kirby just because we now have a brand new appealing new walkway along the side of the marine, marine lake with fully refurbished railings and new seating etc. It makes no sense. More people will come to enjoy it. People's enjoyment of the view is from the seaward side of the wall. The wall would not be impact this um, or the views at all. And as already stated, the opposite would happen and it would become an attraction. We are of the firm opinion that the proposal is exactly what West Kirby needs and will be a welcome boost to the town and the local economy. Our understanding is that there will be several access points allowing people access to the prom. So do not feel that this is going to cause a problem or deter people from visiting the Marine Lake. We are lucky enough to look out onto Marine Lake and understand better than anyone just how much use the walkway along the lake gets. People will still have full access to the walk along the prom section uh, with un un uninterrupted views of the lake, beach and Welsh hills. And the large majority of the walkway along the Marine Lake wall remains as is and is not affected. We do not agree that access to the prom or people's enjoyment of it will be affected in any way at all. We appreciate the width of the prom may be slightly reduced, but the positive impacts of the proposal outweigh this, and this slight compromise cannot in any meaningful way seriously be argued against protection of people's homes and all the catastrophic consequences of more frequent flood events. We do fully understand that the design and appearance of any such structure is going to be contentious, and the simple truth of the matter is that one is not going to please all the people all the time. In fact, far from it. In our opinion, the design and materials proposed are in keeping with the surrounding marine environment, and we like the architecture and appearance. It is a modern and changing world we live in, and such, stru such structures are going to be an increasing feature of our environment. New ways of generating power and reducing CO2 emissions and flood prevention measures, both tidal and freshwater, will change the environment around us, and we have no, no choice other than to accept this. The proposal has been out to consultation long enough, and the proposals are the right compromise between appearance and function. It may be tempting, as a supporter of the proposals, to argue against the comments of objectors, but we understand the proposals do not find favour with all, and we accept this. However, on analysis, we struggle to see the main overriding objection and conclude that people simply don't like the idea of a, or, appear, or appearance of it. 
From a financial point of view, we have potentially a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to get significant financial assistance to move ahead, and if this is, a, is ignored, it will end up costing the Council significantly more in the future, as this problem quite simply will need addressing at some point and is not going to go away. Tourism will not be affected. People's enjoyment of the prom and the walk around the marine lake will not be affected. Access to the prom is more than adequate. It will attract rather than, than, than deter visitors. All the necessary consultees have been consulted and do not object to the proposals, so we do, do know that the environment and wildlife will not be adversely affected if the works are handled appropriately, um, which can be dealt with by way of conditions on the planning consent. Two more paragraphs. Yeah. Uh, we sympathise with those who are not keen on the proposals, and we understand that the, their viewpoint, but we need our homes protecting from flooding so that we can live with them without the worry and constant fear of flooding, and so that we can pass them down to future generations to enjoy. We know that flooding events will increase. That is now fact. And West Kirby and the local businesses and residents need protecting. The focus may be on the prom area at the moment, but the wider area of the flat part of Kirby may well be at risk in the future. Yes, the wall is a compromise, but the protection of people's property, livelihoods and sorry, the protection of people, property, livelihoods, and indeed the economy of the town is more important. As flood events increase, this will have a negative effect on the town as a whole and the local economy. We urge the committee members to view this as a long-term strategy and make good use of the grant from the Environment Agency, which is available. In our view, the proposal gives us, and indeed West Kirby, the best of both worlds, protection from flooding and a new promenade for residents and visitors alike to enjoy. As people who have experienced firsthand the devastating effect of flood events on South Parade, we need protecting. Okay, uh, thanks for that. So we'll now invite the applicant um, Mr. Thomas, some of the World Council. Mr. Thomas, it's, it's taken on average seven minutes for people to make their case um, so far, which is, which is fine. Um, obviously, it's a large application. So the um, uh, members of the public have had seven minutes, so we try and keep within that sort of... Um, Time scale that would be uh, that would be great. So if you can introduce yourself and then um, uh, uh, make your presentation. Thank you, Chair, and through you, Chair. So my name is Neil Thomas. I'm a senior manager at Wirral Council with responsibility for flood and coastal risk management, and I'm the applicant for the um, for this seawall uh, application. So <clears throat> we've heard that West Kirby Seawall was built in 1896 or the 1890s. It is low and it doesn't conform to modern standards for flood defence. So there is a risk at West Kirby. And coastal practitioners measure risk as a likelihood of a 0.5% event happening in any one year. What that means in real terms, it's a combination of water level with the tide and wave levels on top of that. What that means in reality is that at West Kirby, a 0.5% event is around about 7 metres above ordnance data. So if you project that in land, that level at West Kirby, you have 70 properties at risk of flooding now. We also have a methodology that's approved by government, approved by DEFRA, that assesses the risk to life from coastal flooding. And for a 0.5% event at West Kirby, the risk to life is two people for each time that event occurs. And with sea level rise in 100 years, that same event, that 0.5% event, 26 people are at risk of being killed. So we need to reduce that risk. And to reduce it, we need to build a wall or build a structure or make a modification to the promenade. And if the promenade, we know the promenade has an average level of 5.8 metres. That means the difference between 5.8 metres and 7 metres is 1.2 metre high structure. We've considered alternative options to a wall, both through the strategic approach we've taken for flood risk management and our coastal strategy, which is approved at Cabinet, and also through the business case which we developed um, to identify the preferred option for reducing flood risk at West Kirby. The option that has come out of all those processes is for a secondary flood defence at West Kirby in the form of a wall. We've consulted twice about this, 
first in 2015, where there was a positive um, approach. We got posit positive feedback from the community of West Kirby that we need to do something to reduce flood risk at West Kirby. And we also got support for us building a wall at the back of the promenade adjacent to the highway. We consulted again in 2019 on our proposal to do that, which was just limited on the flood defence grant aid that we had in place. And the message we got there was that we needed to do more. So we have done more. We've got more money, both from the council and from the Environment Agency. And through that, we've enhanced the flood defence scheme into a public realm scheme, which extends across the whole footprint of South Parade. We've introduced the wave feature from the wall, making up, taking out the straight lines and putting in a curve. We've integrated seating along the whole length, and we've incorporated a cycle lane that runs from north to south. And we're also looking at refurbishing the derelict bath sites that were demolished in the 1970s. We've taken regard to the environment, and we've worked really hard and, and well with Natural England. The de estuary is really heavily designated. It's a, special protection area, it's a site of special scientific interest, it's a special area of conservation, and it's an internationally recognised Ramsar site for wild birds. So we've worked hard with Natural England to find a way to protect the natural environment by minimising noise and disturbance as a result of the construction. And we have Natural England's support for our, for our proposals. We have significant grant funding for this, and that funding comes from the the government's national adaptation programme. So that means that this scheme, this adaptation scheme, aligns with national policy in preparing for and adapting to climate change. So in summary, this is a scheme that has been developed to national standards. It's been approved by a national panel of experts who have looked at it from a technical an environmental and a financial point of view and have given it support in all those areas. That's how we secured the grant funding. We've listened to the community and developed the scheme as a result of continued consultation. It aligns with national policy in adapting to the impacts of climate change, but most of, most of all, at West Kirby, it will protect lives and property from now and into the future. So I would ask the committee to support this application. Okay. Thanks. So I'll just ask if any members have any <coughs> questions of clarification uh, they want to put to the applicants at this stage. Sammy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you, Chair. It was just a question for clarification. Um, did, you, did I hear you right? So um, two people, the, the risk to life you said is two people per flooding event as it is currently. Did you say that rises to 26? Thank you. That's correct. So as sea levels rise as a result of climate change, for the same significant event of 0.5% occurrence in any one year, there'll be 26 people put at risk of flooding, put, well, whose lives will be at risk. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just, um, you know, we picked up on the pre-app uh, meeting, you know, there is the principle of enticement, you know, owners, like uh, occupiers liability, that doesn't apply strictly, but the principle of enticement is there. We had the tragedy on the wall down here uh, a few months back. Um, what data have we that actually, this actually improves saving lives when we're actually creating a wall with the sea on the other side. And we all know that there is this uh, law of Darwin and the enticement aspect of it. Have you got any thoughts on that or did you consider that at all at any point in the considerations of trade-off of safety? Through you, Chair. So the wall is to manage the risk of flooding now and that risk flooding can impact on lives now. Um, the, the issue about enticement, it, it, it is a good point, but I think the way to deal with that is, is to manage that risk 
if it occurs. It's not a risk that is a tangible risk like the risk of flooding is now because we're not in a position to know whether it will actually materialise or not. If it does, we can do a risk assessment and, and see whether we can manage it if it does occur. Whereas the risk of flooding, that does occur. Uh, I would just point to the fact that we have the seawall here and there was an episode earlier this year. So I think that is a real consideration, whereas I don't believe we've actually lost anybody in West Kirby to any flooding event. It's, it's just, just for, if you would like to just expand on that, as a, because that is a concern of, of mine. Um, so this wall is pr planned to protect against a 0.5 flooding event now. Um, you talked about the, you know, the greater, um, how much greater that will be in the future in terms of a 0.5 flooding event. So will this wall be able to cope, say, in a 50 years or 100 years time for those sort of events? So through you, Chair. Um, thank you. So as sea levels rise, the significant event... That, so how do I can explain this? So for a 0.5% event that would happen now, the frequency of that occurring will increase because extreme sea levels will increase and increase and increase. So that might only happen, well, the, 0. the parameters that cause it to be 0.5 now, in the future those parameters might be a 10% chance of occurrence in any one year. So it will be an even bigger event that will be equivalent to a 0.5% event, 0.5 event in 100 years. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm not sure if this question should be directed uh, at you solely, but it's, uh, or whether or not it should be within the debate. But there are two questions I wanted to ask. One is over construction costs and the costs that we've got and how much the, um, the local authority is putting in and how much we get as grant. Um, um, could you tell me when was the last time that the costings were looked at um, on the basis that over the last six months to a year, construction costs have increased by about 15%. And so when was the last time the costings were looked at? Particularly because if, um, if they were looked at in, you know, more than a year ago, then it's very likely that the costing will be more, or the cost will be more than it is now. So if you were to add another 15% on, that would be another £800,000. And then if you were to factor in another 10, 15% for uh, anything that might happen that you hadn't taken into consideration, you'd be looking at another 30%, which would be 1.6 million. And um, could you let me know whether or not the, the Flood Defence Grant and the other department grant, um, whether they are fixed or whether or not any additional um, costings we can apply for more grant, or does any additional cost come from Willowborough Council taxpayers? And the other issue is on other types of flood defence. Um, because I have noticed that um, certainly in other parts of the world, and in fact in this country as well, in Lynmouth and Devon, they do have flooding similar to what we would have here in West Kirby. It's a seaside town. But the residents there use removable flood barriers at doors um, and driveways, which seems to have alleviated the problem. And, and I understand that these flood barriers individually for households, and I've noticed uh, on the promenade that a lot of households have already done that themselves anyway um, and so um, these apparently can be input for something between 350 and 450 pounds each fitted so in terms of the number of houses that would be affected by flooding um, either uh, sort of immediately 70 or um, but yes I'm, I'm, I well, well 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 one of them was was the cost and the other one is the comparison in using other types of sea defence barriers that are used in other parts of the country to alleviate the same problem where they haven't used a wall, Chair. So, in terms of cost, I am just going to ask the officer to, to, to advise us on 
cost as a material planning consideration. And in terms of, of um, other options, certainly I had it in my list if, if a member hadn't raised it, because the, um, the objector raised other options and the applicant has indicated that other options were considered. So perhaps that question is better rephrased as what other options were considered and why were they rejected? Would that sort of cover? If we can just have guidance on cost. Um, thank you, Chair. The, the issue of the um, cost of the, um, like the, the, the wall is not, um, it's not strictly sort of a material planning consideration because the applicant has sort of put that forward. What we're considering is the, the development um, the, I appreciate your point was about, you know, have costs gone up and is that considered? And that's really a, a separate matter um, for, you know, um, the council in relation to putting money in. It's like having, you know, you need planning permission and you need building regs or you need other forms of um, consents to uh, construct any development. So the issue about the cost, and um, I suspect your question is driving at the, the amount of, like, the council money that could be put into that, that's for a separate committee um, so the the reason that the um, the costs were included in the um, sort of presentation that uh, Joanne made is clearly residents have raised it as an issue um, grant funding is capable of being a material consideration because it's part of it and it's linked to sort of time scales etc but your question there about cost increase or anything is relating to effectively a separate um, decision by a separate, plan, uh, separate committee of the council. Um, so that isn't strictly relevant for, for today. Um, the second part of your question um, in relation to other options that's considered, and I'm sure uh, Mr Thomas can comment on that, but just to remind members, as I know you all know, that you're considering the application that's before you uh, today. And that, that's the key point in that what you've been asked to consider is the application for the 1.2 metre wall in the form that it's been presented to you. Hopefully that helps, Chair. Thank you. So, so, so through you, Chair, I understand I'm answering the question about alternative options considered. Okay. So the coastal strategy um, identified several options. Um, these included increasing the height of the marine lake outer wall. These included um, looking at offshore structures within the de-estuary, both rejected for, on environmental grounds. As part of the business case, we've also considered a demountable barrier along the whole length of um, South Parade. That was discounted because of the cost of um, repurchasing that because they come life expired very quickly and also the costs associated with um, installing and removing it several times over a, a winter season or a flooding season. We considered um, when we went out to consultation whether we could um, look at putting the wall on the landward side of the highway, um, but that again has its own problems with the number of access points for each of the roadways which would all need to be closed off and the access points for each of the properties that would all need to be closed off. And we also looked at property level protection, which I think is what you, you're talking about, and strengthening each of the, um, the boundary walls. But there's difficulties in getting public funding to do those within private properties and enhancing private property for that respect. So that option was discounted as well. So we have explored many alternative options before we've come to this preferred option that we've brought forward. Um, just, just on that last point about the cost, getting public funding for uh, alleviate, alleviating the problem by funding private householders. Um, I, I, am I correct then in saying that, that public funding from the, either from the Environment Agency or from the Council would not be available for householders to mitigate flood risk themselves to their own individual properties? Is that right? I think there's more issues than just the funding. There's also about um, the approach to risk as well. So we, we've, we've implemented, or we're looking at implementing a scheme that by its implementation reduces that risk. 
property level protection relies on each property, making sure that they um, put out their own or you know, initiate their own flood protection measures. Um, and then there's the wider issue of the risk to the promenade. So our, our proposal can keep the promenade open during flood events. It wouldn't be open. It, will, it, will, it would still be flooded with property level protection. And then it wouldn't address the, the property level protection doesn't address the wider um, sea level rise and climate change issues because um, we're not addressing the risk at source through a single um, flood defence. Sorry, on, on the question of the gates that are on the wall, um, who would be responsible for implementing the closure of the gates and then reopening them? The fifth, the, is it 13 that would be a, along the wall? Yes, yeah, so the council will have responsibility of that and we'll arrange that through our highway, highway operations service. Um, we know, because we already monitor them, we know when flood events are going to occur well in advance because we've got tidal predictions which tell us, you know, a year, many years in advance when the high tides are. Surge predictions are made within three days of when actual extreme levels occur. And we know that the weather conditions combine with, with wind direction and speed. Those combination of effects, we know which ones cause flooding at the promenade. So we, we've got plenty of lead in to make sure that the, um, the gates and the barriers are closed before flood events. Okay, Mr. Neil, thank you very much for your presentation. Go on then. Well, Sorry. Just some respect of the predictions. You can predict years ahead, decades ahead, and three days ahead. Was that a consideration of how we could perhaps manage it? Because the risk to life, the risk to property, I can, I can understand where you're coming from, but if we know that far ahead, surely there's no reason for cars to be being washed down the prom. Surely there's no reasons for cars to be bobbling around people's drives like, like, we, saw, like we saw on the video. Is that not something we could, we could have looked at as an alternative or did you look at as an alternative? So I, th I think what you're talking about is flood warning, really, and the take-up of flood warning service. Now, that's not a service that the council has a responsibility for. That's a service that the Environment Agency has a responsibility for. OK. <laughs> Again, thank you very much for uh, your presentation and for answering the question. Um, we're now going to hear from uh, our... Uh, statutory consultee, um, the Environment Agency, Mr. Hope. Is this Mr. Hope? Excellent. Um, as, as I say, it's, it's taken people about seven minutes to, to, to say what they have to say. Um, so if you can try and keep somewhere within that and then uh, see what questions come your way. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, so my name is Ollie Hope. I am the Um, so I'm the Area Flood and Coastal Risk Manager for Cheshire and Merseyside um, and I also have a, um, uh, a role of running our incident response across the North West so um, obviously I see the impacts of the sorts of flood events that we're talking about uh, very regularly. Um, the, the primary aim of the Environment Agency in, 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 in around flooding is to protect people, property and, and livelihoods which we've spoken about. Um, today and all of our ski, all the schemes that we either deliver ourselves or fund in combination with local authorities and other risk management agencies seek to do that as well as bring in additional benefits to the areas that we're investing in. Um, it would be remiss of me to, to you know, given that the fact that we're in um, the midst of COP26 to not just spend a moment talking around climate impact. Um, regardless of the outcomes of what's happening in Glasgow over the next fortnight, we're going to have changes due to climate and, and we need to adapt to those changes. Um, the crisis on, on climate is clearly global, but it is impacting Wirral today. It is impacting West Kirby um, and it's in those impacts are being felt in our shops and in our homes. The, 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 the threat, climate change is, is unequivocal. 
So um, temperature change is already happening. Sea, level, sea levels have risen already. And both temperature change and, climate, and uh, sea level rise are going to get more and more severe as the century goes on. Um, the data used as the basis for, for this um, design is the same um, data that is used for the Climate Change Committee, who actually advise the government. They're the independent statutory body that advises government. Um, and I think it's clear we've, we've spoken around the um, potential number of, of lives at risk um, due to the, to, to, the, to the threat of climate change. And I think it's worth just highlighting um, you know, what's happened in, in Germany this summer, where over 200 lives were lost. And, and what that was was a case of um, a, a, a community or communities not adapting in time uh, to prepare and protect them against the threat of climate change, and I think that's the very real risk here, is that we are um, that we do not commit when we know what threat is coming, um, and you know therefore we, we, we feel the impacts that, that have been discussed today. So I think support and funding, um, just to come on to that point, because I know uh, funding has been mentioned uh, a number of times, and obviously the Environment Agency. Um, we oversee the kind of national assurance process around funding release for all flood schemes. Um, we've robustly assured this scheme, it's full business case as we would with every other scheme that's submitted to us nationally and ultimately goes to form part of the £5.2 billion programme for the next six years. Um, and with this, with this project, with this scheme, this really is the kind of last moment for this project team to actually be able to deliver the, the kind of protection to people, property and livelihoods um, in order for them to actually start on site next year, not have to deal with potentially rising costs associated with delays um, and therefore you know, actually be able to um, work with the funding that is currently, as we sit here today, um, you know, guaranteed on the basis of a start, of a start on, on, on site next year. Um, it was mentioned in the original run through of the of the planning how and um, there's some uh, government funding what's, what's called other government funding which is a grant which is only um, actually guaranteed for, for the current financial year um, and then the further funding that comes from the environment agency um, we cannot guarantee if, if there are further project delays because we have a you know as I've said a 5.2 billion pound program nationally um, and you know society is waking up to the threat of flood risk and recognising the need to develop schemes to protect communities. So the message from the Environment Agency is that the climate impacts are coming, we're feeling them already on the world um, and we very much need to adapt to those while we still have the chance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Al. I will open it up to questions again. I wonder if, if I could just ask, I think we heard the uh, the, the objectors suggesting that it wasn't, in fact, in line with national guard. I just want to um, put that one by you. As, as I know in the report, I think it's on page uh, 20, there's commentary about why it needs to be um, 1.2 metres high. And I think one of the key objections has been that it's 1.2 metres high. But perhaps you could run through why it needs to be 1.2 metres high rather than... 1.1 or 1 I think what I can say, Chair, I mean, I've, I've, I've got people who've been involved in the design and, and know that, that detail um, and can certainly walk through through that question in, um, if required. I, I think that the what I would say is that um, every single option around any flood scheme comes through our national assurance process um, and it's reviewed from a technical standpoint um, against our guidance and it's also reviewed from a kind of cost benefit ratio um, and this um, solution the solution that's been presented today was the one that was endorsed in line with all of our technical guidance and standards and um, if there's further questioning around the um, how the, the, the level was built up then I would defer to colleagues who've been involved in that process. Yeah, I found the paragraph so sorry, it's 7.1.8 seems to go into the detail uh, about that, but you've had, had overview of, of that. And, and uh, my second question, if I may, before I just open it out, we, we've heard men, uh, mention and questions on uh, alternatives. Um, did you just review uh, this particular um, scheme 
or, or do, as part of your cost benefit analysis, would you have would you have looked at the, the potential for for different solutions, and, and have you have you commented on that back to the applicant? So the um, the, the way the, the the business case is structured for any scheme that comes forward to our national assurance process is that all of the options um, are set out and, and Mr Thomas talked through the various options with, that were considered and discounted either on technical grounds or in some cases are discounted on the you know the overall benefits of the scheme for the investment um, it's also worth noting that you know that the key um, to the benefit ratio is that actually we need to be able to demonstrate a certain level of benefit in order for partnership funding to be guaranteed and for us to be able to deliver that, uh, provide that flood defence granting aid. Um, so all of those checks were met and this, this solution that's been proposed was the, you know, the, the front runner and, and as I say met all of those checks and, and, and uh, made it through that assurance process. Um, in terms of just the, the broader uh, options and solutions, I think, um, you know, there, there are, um, we've got to remember the scale of what we're building and, and the threat that is, you know, is a long-term threat. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's often easily overlooked the sheer manpower involved in deploying non-fixed assets. Um, and in this case, you know, obviously those, bene those costs were assessed in the whole life of the project. So I know Mr. Thomas was talking about the, you know, the, um, the cost of replacing the, uh, the barrier, the demountable barrier units, but that also has to be taken into consideration with literally the operational cost of deploying staff at a scale to be able to erect those barriers and then take them back down again, often in very quick succession. So there's, there's those, the whole life cost is what's considered when we talk about benefit ratio. I was listening intently to your uh, issue, and I've seen a news article recently where the, the, the actual head of your organisation was talking very much about demand outstripping resources. And you referred to that if there was a delay in this scheme, we would effectively end up on a five -year, another five-year waiting list to reapply. Is that fact? I agree, um, Chair. I, I, um I can't guarantee, it's effectively the loss of the guarantee, I think, is, is what I'm saying. So um, there are, um, there's a finite level of money nationally. Um, when we um, allocate funding, it is done on a national priority basis, not, you know, within the Wirral, not just within the North West, not just within the Cheshire Merseyside area that I face. So, so we can't guarantee that that funding will still be available um, if there is further delays, and you know, the further delays are likely to increase costs as well, um, which will erode contingencies and potentially make the business case less favourable. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I heard you mention the recent floods in Germany and the regrettable deaths there, but am I right in thinking that that's a materially different type of flooding circumstance than we're talking about here? And could you just clarify that for members that, you know, as we heard, the predictability of flooding uh, at West Kirby, you know, we, we can say now really the range of days that it's going to happen in any one time going forward. And was that flooding in Germany equivalent to the one in 200 year event that we're talking about here? Three, Chair. Yeah. So, um, in terms of the first question, it was um, you're quite right. It was a fluvial flooding event in, in Germany, or well, a combination of surface water and river flooding. Um, there were, I, th I think, the the reason I referenced that point was because the um, you know, what climate change is doing is, and and will continue to do, is to exacerbate the severity of storms, and it is also going to continue to raise sea levels around the world. Now, um, those two things are very relevant in relation to the scheme for West Kirby, um, because you are um, looking at, well, we've already, seen, uh, we've already seen sea levels rise. We're seeing storms affect our region that are more severe than we've ever seen before. Um, and that combined effect over the next, you know, over the next generation 
um, is going to mean that you have a higher standard baseline sea level, so you have higher natural tidal effects that, as you say, are predictable over you know cycles. But if you get a, a you know a severe and unprecedented storm during that period, then the effect of what well the wave effects that we you I'm sure we've all seen in video footage from from the West Kirby promenade are, are just going to get worse and worse. So the reason I referenced that was because it's the same effect of heightened storm severity that, um, that will impact West Kirby. Um, in terms of the, um, the second question, um, I'm not able to, to, I don't have the data to hand actually on what um, return periods uh, the German event was, um, but the, the point was around, um, you know, within and this is something that I see nationally around our kind of, and this is the reason we have a £5.2 billion pound flood programme, is that um, we, we know these impacts are coming um, and we have ways of protecting our communities and, and this proposal is one of them. Um, but while they're written down on paper, that is all they are, they're proposals. Um, and we have the opportunity now to adapt and prevent the types of events that cause loss of life. Um, and, and that was the reference to the German event and the failure to adapt in that way, which has ultimately led to a tragic loss of life. Thank you. So, given what you just said there, do you have data? How much has the sea level risen at West Kirby in the last 20 years, 30 years? So I think from the, um, the data that I have is that the sea level um, that we've seen to date is around 200 millimetres. Um, now it's, um, that's, you know, so that raises the kind of baseline already from what we're talking about. And then in terms of um, the kind of longer term projections for West Kirby, um, we could see that um, depending on different CO2 emission scenarios, you know, those could... Um, range from um, well, current mean sea levels estimated to be between you know nationally 45 mils and, and 111 mils higher than it was in even in the 80s to 2000 kind of period um, but from present day levels we could by 2050 we could see a further rise of somewhere between 69 millimeters and 234 millimeters and the reason for that variation is because across the country it, it differs based on like in the southern in the southern part of England we've actually got you know the, the height of the land starting to adjust in relation to the sea um, so the, there's obviously these are projections on, on, on different temperature scenarios as I'm sure you're familiar with um, but that as I say that 200 mil um, change is, is, is something that we've already seen I don't know if, if um, I can invite Alan to perhaps comment on um, on any of that is that okay yeah thank you thank you chair through you chair um yeah I'm, i agree with with, uh, with what ollie's saying i mean there are it depends on your co2 emission scenario as to how much sea level is actually going to rise over the uh, over the next uh, century um certainly historically we know that in this area that uh, throughout the the 20th century there was about an average of between two and three millimeters per annum rise in mean sea level. Um, the current estimates, and we basically the assessments that are carried out nationally tend to work on a medium emission scenario, 95 percentile um, condition. Um, and figures for that tend to, tend to show that we're probably looking at now running somewhere in the order of about five millimeters per year. Um, how much has the height of the wall been determined by what is considered um, aesthetically acceptable? And um, would the ideal height um, be taller if aesthetics weren't a consideration? Yes, I think. I, th I mean, I think certainly the aesthetics came into it because it certainly was raised, as far as I'm aware, during the consultation, early consultation about the height of the wall and you know, could it could it be lower? Could it be could it be higher? And Ideally, probably you, you could actually make it higher, but it's certainly from an aesthetic point of view, um, then I don't think it was acceptable. And certainly, I think as far as the... Uh, 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 sorry, sorry, I, I, I wrongly assumed you were with the Environment Agency. No. Uh, so the, the question is to, to the statutory body. Okay. If, if, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm, Apolog Apolog Apologies, Chair. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, uh, 
sorry, through you, Chair. I think, um, can you repeat the question, sorry, because I, <laughs> it was directed at somebody else. Thank you. Yeah. How, how much has the height of the wall been determined by what is considered um, aesthetically acceptable, which is the words on the agenda? And if aesthetics weren't a consideration, uh, what would the height be? So, uh, Chair, I think that's a question more for the applicant than a okay. me. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. There's, uh, obviously, there's no, you can't answer questions that aren't yet. I, I think possibly it comes back to the question, the first question was, is it high enough to meet the standards, which I think was an objection that was, was raised. And I think we got an affirmative, yes, it was. Um, so whether aesthetics is in there or not, it doesn't matter because it meets the... Uh, and again, I'll refer you later probably again to the, the part of the report that goes through the, the mathematics of it. Is that all right? Uh, Kath, then. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I I'm going to come back again, I'm sorry, to the different methods that can be used to mitigate the flood risk to West Kirby. Um, West Kirby Marina, if I'm not wrong, acts as a stilling basin between the sea and the land. And so however much you get waves, uh, West Kirby, I'm assuming, is fairly unique in having that mitigating circumstance already naturally there with the marina. And secondly, there are other parts of the country, as I alluded before, Lynmouth, which is a seaside town it's in this country, and they don't have a wall. They have individual residents and businesses using their own flood defences, which seem to work. Anybody who's been to Venice knows that um, up until last year when they did another sea defence which goes out into the sea and is under the water and then comes up when it needs to for flood defences. But other than that, all the businesses have the walls. And um, there's a village in Tenerife called Alcala and that has to contend with rain coming off the mountains and the Atlantic Ocean and it goes into a sort of a horseshoe. And what they do there, it's a sort of seaside area they don't have a wall, they have cattle grids in the floor. And I just feel that there must be, in this day and age, a better way of preventing sea flooding in West Kirby than a wall, that there must be something else that would be as adequate. Because a lot of the time, now, once this wall is up, it's up for supposedly 100 years. And before we commit uh, the residents of West Kirby to a one Catholic, point two. Again, a question. Uh, well, the question, question. The question is. is and is the, the question, and, and is the question I, to the environment well, it, well, agency? Well, it is because the environment agency must know whether or not there are other adequate areas. They do it in other parts of the country, and they do it in other parts of the world. And West Kirby has a basin so, that will so mitigate the some of the footage. So the question, if it is summarised, because yeah, you, what, you, why, Kathy, why can we not think of something not, else? Other than, I'm just so, asking: is, is I, there any I other think, way Kath, other than a wall? That's all I'm asking, Chair. Order. I think I asked the question whether they had reviewed the other options initially, to which the, the, uh, the environment agency answered uh, that they had reviewed other options. Um, Mr Hobart, I don't know whether you have an answer, it's not necessarily within your remit, on whether you're aware of, of, um, of, of um, Venice or, or um, the village in, in um, Tenerife. It strikes me that when the applicant spoke, the applicant said that they considered an offshore, um, a, but, but it was detrimental to biodiversity and wildlife. Now, so clearly, you know, the applicants in their, um, in their presentation said they had considered something which may be very similar to, uh, to, to Venice. Uh, are you in a position to, to, to pick anything else from your point of view as a statutory agency? Um, I'm afraid that I'm not, I'm not familiar, anywhere near familiar enough with the locations that you've, you've referenced to really comment on those. I, th I think I'd come back just to two things. So one that I've already mentioned, which is the, you know, the assurance process that the Environment Agency goes through for every scheme or that every scheme has to go through when it's submitted to funding for, um, with the Environment Agency. And as, I, as, as I've already said, all options are set out and all of the options that the applicant referenced earlier were, were set out in that, that business case and assessed accordingly. Um, and we, and you know, the favoured option, the option that we committed funding towards is the one that's been presented to us today. 
And the second thing I would say that I think maybe is a, in a way of perhaps giving some assurance to you on the, um, around the, you know, the, the kind of technical expertise and the um, insight into best practice in the industry of flood defence is that one of the things that we as environment agency um, do with our um, when we're working with partners with other risk management uh, authorities is that we um, we provide and we support access to um, framework contractors um, and designers who work with us nationally and and these these organizations are world leading organizations in construction and design and have access to global you know resources and, and insight um, to make sure that the solutions they develop are, are the best for the communities that they're being developed for. So, um, and I know that the, the team here have worked um, with, with those, those uh, framework um, partners to develop what's, what's on the table today. Thank you very much for your um, presentation and answering uh, those questions you could. Um, I'll now invite the Ward Councillor. Did you, did you want to address us? Chair members, thank you. Good evening. Um, I sat this afternoon and uh, finished a meeting about Hobbes Street and started to write some words down. Um, and after about an hour, I gave up and thought, actually, you know what, this is, a, for me, a relatively easy question. Um, no one's denying that West Kirby is under threat of flooding. Um, but, to summarise, the people of West Kirby generally don't want this particular scheme. And I'm here to tell you that. And I hope you listen to what I say and understand the majority of people in West Kirby don't want this particular scheme. You've heard all the detail from petitioners who very eloquently put their, their case. Um, during the presentation, one of the slides said, um, it will change West Kirby promenade. To damn right it will. Um, and it will change it for 100 years or more not for the good of West Kirby. Um, there are a number of houses that need to be protected, but that can be done, in my opinion, and I'm not an engineer, I'm not a flood defense expert, but can be done in a better way than this particular proposal puts forward. I've sat on the planning committee and we are asked to judge each um, proposal on its merits. This one is, I'm afraid, a fail for me. This should not go forwards. No one is denying that we need to protect the houses, but this particular scheme is not it. The gentleman uh, from the council said that the, the scheme had been assessed for, and I can't remember the three things that he said, but one was the engineering part of it, one was the, the technical detail, but not the design. The design hadn't been assessed by them. That's the problem with the scheme. The scheme doesn't suit West Kirby. It's a Victorian town. It has a Victorian promenade that people come to enjoy. This will, in my opinion, spoil West Kirby. Not for the good. I support, the petitioner supports a flood defense scheme, not this particular one. We should lead, excuse me, When I joined the council 20 years ago, uh, an experienced councillor then said to me, the problem with Wirral is that it never leads. It never puts something forward before it hears somebody else do it first. And this is an ideal case. We have an opportunity to do something really quite special. The, the temptation to accept the funding for the public realm in West Kirby is, is it's almost overwhelming. But the people, of, you will spoil West Kirby for a hundred years. Now, if you want to do that, just because you want to accept that scheme, and I find it a little disappointing that the Environment Agency came here this evening and effectively said, if you don't accept this, we'll take our funding away. All we're trying to do 
is find the best scheme for a town on, in our patch on the Wirral. And I don't believe this is the best scheme for West Kirby. Thank you. Okay, that's what I've done now. Okay, so if we can um, maybe turn now to um, to all officers in terms of questions before we get into uh, the debate, um, and I'll, I'll I'll kick off by by looking at the highways engineers. The point was made about the width on the roadside. I think particularly where the the, the most concern was. Um, you heard what was said, uh, Carl. If you, if you could possibly address that, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. For you, Chair. Um, the footway behind the flood wall, uh, directly adjacent to the road, will have uh, a minimum width of 1.2 metres. And due to its curved design, which features along its entire length, uh, at its maximum it will be approximately 1.7 metres. So this will allow vulnerable users to pass behind the wall and allow other users and vulnerable users to pass each other. Concerns regarding the 1.2 metre width are noted. Uh, however, this is similar to the available width that currently exists directly adjacent to uh, the parallel parking bays along parts of South Parade due to the location of um, street furniture, uh, such as street lighting columns, benches, bins, some of the sheltered undercover seating areas as well. There will be multiple pedestrian access points provided along South Parade uh, that are two metres wide. Uh, which will be sufficient space for all, including vulnerable users, to enter onto the promenade. And there is a relatively short distance between each crossing point that is proposed, uh, which will prevent any pedestrians um, either overcrowding or overspilling onto the carriageway when accessing the promenade and the parking base. Thank you, Chair. Uh, any other questions then to... To officers or, or back to Carl. Okay, well, we'll open it up for general debate from members. Any comments? What we've heard, what we think, now we've heard it. Okay, right, so this is the planning committee, and we have a scheme in front of us that we must come to a decision on. And we've heard all the evidence. Uh, and all the material planning issues. Nobody has denied there's a need for some sort of flood defence at the coast. So the need has been quite clearly established. The solution is what people are, are debating about. Is this the solution? We've heard from a number of experts that, in their opinion, this is the best solution that can be achieved with all the parameters and the public consultation that took place in the early days of the scheme, and we've come to make a decision on the scheme. So that's how I'm focusing my debate, uh, my contribution. I've also just, just, just literally, because we did have a little delay <laughs> before the meeting started, uh, I remember, remember as a, 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 as a you know, young up and coming politician, and I remember the floods in Rill, um, and I went back to 1990 in Rill, and they were, they were huge, and you know, this is a long, long time ago. Uh, Tawan, um, uh, you know, w w w was, was devastated, there was loss of life. It was, and it, it, it was, in the end, it came back down to that the sea defences, part of the problem was the sea defences were inadequate. So we're being given an adequate solution for the risk that has been assessed for the future. Now, comments about the aesthetics um, are important because the visual impact on what is one of our, you know, big assets, and that then is 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 really is a judgment call on, on whether aesthetically it will improve, or aesthetically will make it worse. I don't find myself embarrassed by the imagery on Channel Four TV every single half hour or every night, of the big metal thing running down the promenade next to the sea defences, they don't make, they make me think that's iconic about, that's what Will is about, it's a peninsula surrounded by water and all the things great that go with that and to me, the aesthetic appeal of the sea defence in the waved formation and the seating arrangements 
may be judged, and you know, you'll all have your own judgment, may be judged to be an enhancement of that promenade rather than a detriment. That is a, a, a judgment call, and everyone on this committee can, can make that. If I do not believe that measured against what we've seen in terms of the flood risk and the issues that have gone on, and the other package that is coming in with it as part of the application, which is the uh, public realm enhancements, uh, many will say long overdue, to me, I think it, it, it's, it's a five point odd million investment in, in West Kirby in, in totality that may eventually save someone's life and may actually make the place more popular to go to. Uh, you know, the devastation, to, to rely on individuals protecting their property is only gonna be as strong as the individual who, if all individuals protect the property and that scheme isn't on the table today. So for me, I think this has been seems to be, and I'll never never close my mind to, to being dissuaded, but seems to be the best solution that has the funding and the ability to be delivered as well as protect those people's lives. So I'm finding it very difficult at the moment to listen to arguments that, well, it's not, you know, the risk is there, the risk is established. I've seen the video of the car floating down the, the prom. You don't need to see much more to, to explain that we are now in a situation we have to do something. So my, my view is that, you know, this is what is before us and we'll wait and see what, whether there's any uh, reason for refusal. But uh, to keep describing and say this will ruin West Kirby, and it's a tactic that is often used to decry something, call it an ugly wall, call it what you like. Well, it's bound to raise people. People will sign a petition to say, yeah, because you've said it's an ugly wall, or you said it's going to ruin West Kirby. There's no proof to, to back that statement that this is going to ruin West Kirby. I don't know of any proof that's been put forward that that would ruin West Kirby. And it's, you know, people may shake their head. It hasn't ruined other parts of the borough and other parts where we protect people. And to be honest, things by, you know, I don't know of a planning condition that can stop someone looking at high waves on a wall. I really, I really don't. Be, otherwise, there wouldn't be any sea defences, would there, anywhere in the country? So it, it, it's red headings and spurious things like that that take us away from the main aim of protecting lives, enhancing the public realm. And if you like, I'll put my, my hand on my heart and say I do not believe this wave wall with the seating is anything but an enhancement for the promenade. That's my opinion, people can disagree, and I'm happy to come back. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, I think, you know, Councillor Fawkes has, um, has ever gone to the heart of the matter. It's a planning meeting, and we have to talk about planning issues. Um, but saying that it's um, you know the enticement aspect is spurious is <clears throat> utterly you know incorrect in my opinion it's not spurious it relates to there's a trade-off of what would be a potential risk in in the wall and the potential risk of a one in 200 year event which is what this wall is there to stop but on planning issues it is an area of special landscape value. And to put that in context for you, as ward members for Hoylake, we've had a battle to, because North Parade in Hoylake was going to be downgraded and lose its aspect, its uh, area of special landscape value. And the reason given was ships and the turbines you can see are in the bay. And that's how fragile landscape, special landscape value is. So, a one and a half kilometer wall, 5,000 tons of concrete, I don't believe can enhance um, West Kirby. And I think in the next iteration of the local plan, it could well lose its, that accreditation. And that will be down to this meeting tonight, passing this application. If that wall is the reason, and I believe you know, quite strongly, given what we've had to contend with the North Parade, ships, and distant turbines. That's how fragile it is. That we need to think very hard tonight about the aspect of special landscape value. That is the planning decision tonight. If it wasn't for that, and if it, if it was a seawall, you know, somewhere else that didn't have that status, 
It's a, it's a no-brainer. We've got the money. Let's do it. And as councillors, when you first hear this, when I first heard it, I thought, well, that's great. It's got to be good. But then you learn more and more and more about it. You learn about how utterly predictable it will be. You learn how South Parade, there is no properties there that aren't low and very low risk of sea flooding. I find it difficult with that knowledge that the government website for long-term flood risk has every property on South Parade as, and correct me if I'm wrong, officers can you know, do their own uh, comment on that, they're all, there's no high risk, there's no very high risk, they're all low and very low risk of sea flooding. And that aspect is the key to me. Because why are we even thinking about this if that is what the government website says? I appreciate climate change. We're not denying that. We're not saying the situation won't get worse. It's always had. Every 30 years, I talk to locals, it's partially in my ward. The locals are content with the sea flood. They expect it. They buy there. South Parade is the most expensive real estate in Merseyside. It's not the most expensive real estate in Merseyside because it's under massive sea flood risk. Through you, Chair. I don't know how much longer the debate's going to go on, but I thought I would uh, step in now and say what I want to say. And I have not heard in this evening's debate any compelling argument for the proposed seawall defence that outweighs the potential harm a wall that is four foot high and almost a mile in length would inflict on the character of West Kirby. Linmouth in Devon is a seaside area like West Kirby, and they have alleviated any potential for flood risk by the individual houses and businesses using flood prevention gates, negating the need to ruin their landscape. A method of flood defence that I have been assured is adequate by a consultant civil engineer. The promenade only floods on rare occasions and adequate warning is given for householders to take their own preventative measures. Since the last flooding in 2013, like Linmouth, householders have installed their own flood prevention gates. Many of the walls of the properties opposite the marina are already higher than the proposed seawall. The proposed seawall, if there was a flood event, would either trap the water if it breached the wall or be useless if the gates did not work or were not put in place in a timely manner. Other properties along the front are on an elevated position. This wall will ruin the Victorian facade that so encapsulates the attraction of the promenade for visitors from all over the country who sit in their cars with an ice cream or in the seating known as the ovens to take in the view across the marina. My parents-in-law used to sit in those seats with fish and chips from marigolds and a flask of tea. The report states in section 315 that 70 properties were identified as currently at risk from a 0.5% annual exceedance probability event, one in 200 years, that were better protected by the scheme combined with over three, 33 million of flood damages avoidance over the lifetime of the scheme. The flooding in 2014 affected 13 properties. There is no mention of the economic damage this war would cause to the West Kirby economy in respect of loss of tourism and the business income that flows from this. As a leisure peninsula, for us to wantonly ruin one of our destination visitor attractions is nothing short of scandalous. The construction period is from February 2022 to November 2022. The West Kirby economy will be decimated by this development for at least a year as there is no guarantee that the scheme will be completed within the original timescale. The residents of West Kirby will be plunged into a dystopian nightmare. The cost of this scheme to the rural taxpayer is stated at 2,378,000. This may increase as raw materials and labour costs have all increased over the past 12 months. The council's finances are in a precarious position and an additional unforeseen drain on the public purse is not feasible. The scheme is designed to negate a possible loss of life as a consequence of storm damage of two people. This scheme, however, could lead to increased danger to life and limb of pedestrians and those with mobility issues who will have to negotiate not just the road with only 13 access areas onto the promenade, but a long, flat cycle route, which could lead to cyclists speeding and posing a danger to pedestrians navigating their way onto the promenade. I do not think that the economic and visual damage that this scheme would inflict on West Kirby is outweighed by the benefits and that the cost-benefit analysis is flawed. As a local authority, we should protect landscapes of special character and value, 
and not allow development where their visual impact would be inappropriate in terms of character, appearance and landscape setting of the surrounding area, or introduce new intrusive development within an otherwise open setting, especially along a promenade, skyline or along the undeveloped coast. Local residents do not want this scheme. In light of my comments above, I do have wording for refusal, Chair. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've listened to this evening, reading the document, and I've listened this evening to um, opinions and, and expert opinions. Um, I'm, I'm yet to be, and not likely to be, convinced so far that us turning down um, th this kind of investment that is, that is there to protect residents, pedestrians and uh, property from uh, potential floods in the future. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've not been convinced that we should be turning this down. Um, you know, f for the majority of us, certainly, you know, councillors, in 30 years' time, we're not going to be here. We're not going to be here to actually see whether or not um, this is needed, whether or not, retrospectively, we've made the right decision now. And we're going to have to, the council will have to deal with anything that comes in the future, and we will have to be answerable to those people in the future as to why we failed to, to implement this flood defence. Um, if we don't vote for this tonight. So I'd, I'm, I'm in favour of, of this flood defence um, uh, and this planning application based on the expert opinions that have been uh, expressed here tonight and in the reports that have been presented to us, um, not on the personal opinions of, of, um, of people um, and how aesthetically this might affect the area. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think there are some problems with this application. Um, it is a shame to see the width of the promenade itself reduced, which is, you know, fair enough. There has been a, a wall being put there, but at the same time, the number of car parking spaces is remaining the same. So the compromise has come from the public realm, uh, from the pedestrians, uh, rather than from the cars. But I think from listening to the speakers tonight, um, it's clear that a wall is the only feasible option. There are all these other things with sort of we can take it in, take it back. But I'm not sure whether that would actually look aesthetically better. And of course, you've got the problems with maintenance and, and upkeep that aren't part of the initial cost. It seems like a lot of people are against this application um, at least from reading some of the comments, because the flooding is not that bad now. Well, this wall is not for now, really. It's for the future where these flooding events are going to become far more significant and far more likely. So I think it's sensible um, that we do support this. Thank you. Thanks for having uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, I... I sometimes feel like we're having different conversations. I feel really concerned and quite worried when we talk about the predictable nature of climate concerns. We only have to switch on the news. We look around, you know, we've talked about uh, the rest of the country, we've talked about Europe, wildfires and major droughts and serious flooding and really extreme heat, um, really extreme um, climate change. Talking about it as if it's predictable really, I think, misses the point and the nature of climate change. World leaders wouldn't be gathered together as they are just now if it wasn't such an immediate and pressing threat. And I think to Harry's point, we agree that there is a threat and there is an issue and being able to predict it, I think, would be foolhardy. We've heard from experts and specialists, I am neither of those two things, that say, yes, there's an issue, and this is our best preventative measure. I think the question to say, is it high enough? I, I was in that same space too, and we've heard the answer, which, which feels encouraging. It won't be to everybody's taste, as Councillor Falk said, in terms of the aesthetics of it. My personal belief is that we have a moral imperative to protect life first and foremost, and this does that. 
I don't see it obstructing accessibility, as we've heard. I don't see it obstructing views, and I don't see it obstructing people's ability to enjoy one of Wirral's really beautiful spots. And in doing so, it, prevent, it protects life. Um, it, so it seems quite simple to me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, I think all, the, all members have, have, have made a contribution. I'll just give my two penneth. Um, uh, I think we've all started with the... Um, the question, you know, is it is it needed? That's, that's the first question that uh, that we've all asked. We might have come to different conclusions, but that's the question um, that we first need to to consider. And I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that that, that it is needed. Um, we've heard about the sea levels uh, rising. We know storm events are, are, are a lot more uh, common, and, and that's the the sad reality of of climate change. Um, it strikes me, you know, over the next 10, 20 years, politicians are going to have to make decisions to combat and adapt to the consequences of global temperature rise and climate change. Um, and to be frank, on a rising scale of difficult decisions, I don't think this one is anywhere near um, a difficult decision. Uh, certainly not the decisions that are likely to come down the, uh, the road in the next 10 to 20 years. So if we accept that the case is made for a sea defence wall, or a majority of us, of us or a sea defence of some description, what flows from that is to ask ourselves whether this is the appropriate design, and, uh, uh, not design, sorry, is the appropriate solution. Um, questions are asked to the applicants and by the, uh, um, the, the Environment Agency whether other options have been considered, and I think we got, you know, fairly clear answers um, on, on, on the, the other options had been considered uh, and had not, uh, not, not met the, um, not met the, uh, the required uh, standard to combat the problem that's been identified in this part of, of, of the coast. So if we accept that, then what flows from that is really more or less what we've got in front of us. The applicant to their credit has consulted um, to try and influence the design of the wall. And it seems to me either we have a wall similar to the one in New Brighton on seafront with the seats facing uh, towards the dips and what have you, or we have one at Road Edge um, that, uh, that faces uh, the views across the sea. I don't accept for one moment um, that building the wall there will mean that people can't see the sea. Of course they can see the sea. The problems are hard will still be there. The seating that's incorporated within it uh, will in fact be facing the sea and, uh, and most people that go there actually go to see the wildlife and the birds um, and, and, and the, general, uh, the general view. We've explored, I think, with the applicants uh, and with the Environment Agency the question of the height. That was certainly a concern that I had when I first looked over the papers for the, um, uh, for the application, whether it could be any lower. The sea defences at New Brighton are 1.2 metres high. Um, I was at New Brighton on Sunday and, and measured them. This is what this is what comes to it. Um, they're exactly the same height, so the, the maths clearly works. And uh, I think Harry referred to it. 7.1.8, um, paragraph 7.1.8 of the report goes through the details of those maths. And we're not in a position um, to, um, to gain say. Uh, the science um, behind that. We also have assurances within the reports by experts on the impact on birds and biodiversity, and that's been some of the delay getting it to, um, to committee, because I know officers went back to Natural England to the, um, uh, to the applicant to demand the additional reports that are necessary to mitigate or to prove to us that there will be no impact on the biodiversity, which speaks to the SSI rating that it, that it has. So the final issue before us then is, is, is in terms of character, and, and reference has been made to, to the Victorians. Now, when the Victorians first put in place what was there, they just upped and did it because that's what they wanted to do, because that's what they did. Uh, the Victorians, if they saw a problem or wanted to create an opportunity, they up and did it. And I can't help feeling, you know, in my own mind, that if the Victorians were here now, facing the problems that we're facing, they would up and do it. They would get on with it, because that strikes me as the mindset 
um, of the Victorian. Yes, it won't look quite as Victorian as it has. The promenade will need to adapt to the problems that we find ourselves in, not back in the 1800s, but now in the, um, in, in the uh, second millennium. Um, yep, climate change and a modern solution. Will it be detrimental? To be honest, I don't think so. I think it will be an interesting design. I think it will add to the evolving nature of that promenade. In the planning balance, and that's what we have to bear in mind, it's clear that the benefits of mitigating the effect of flooding in that area over a 100-year period clearly and demonstrably outweigh the harm, which, frankly, I can only identify as those people who will be unable to see the sea when sat in their car demonstrably um, proved to be um, uh, required. However, I did hear a member suggest that there might be reasons for refusal. Um, so I'll take that first, then, if I may. Thank you, Chair. So it's for um, DPP 420-01627, West Kirby Marine Lake, South Parade, West Kirby. And the reason for refusal is that the proposed development due to its location within close proximity to a designated area of special landscape value will introduce an intrusive feature within an open setting and is thereby contrary to unitary development plan policy LA1, the protection of special landscape value. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I was just checking, so paragraph 7, 7.1, uh, references the policy that you're, that you're saying, so I'll just... Okay. Okay, is, is that seconded? I seconded, That's sir. Seconded. If members have had a chance to look at paragraph 7, you can see... Um, the requirements of LAN1, uh, which is, it basically comes down to character. That's it. Okay. That's, 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 that's it. Yeah. Any, any debate on, on, on that, or are we content to as vote? A, as I say, Chair, you know, the, the, it is a judgment, judgment call. Um, and, you know, despite, I would despite the negative, the ability or, or the, the tendency of people to oppose rather than be for something is, is, is fairly common what we experience on planning committee. There was a sizable uh, petition in favour, so there is also some difference of opinion within the local community itself, which has to be recognised, and I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying there isn't, but there may even be this difference of opinion amongst the local ward councils, because we've only heard from from two. So that that's a judgment call. Um, would we be able, would we be able to defend that at appeal when we see lots of other seaside resorts with similar similar structures and seem to be thriving? Uh, I, I don't know, but the protection of human life. I'm on the basis of that reason for refusal. I, I, I will stick to my guns and st say I, I would. Be in support, and I'm not prepared to, to play King Canute uh, with people's lives, and I'm not prepared to do that. Okay, just just to clarify one thing with you, just this: there, was, there wasn't a petition of support; it was the number of letters. I, I would yes, he claimed to represent a sizable part support, of our community. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In other words, the, the letters of support would have, would have been sufficient to trigger the 15 barrier. So there are. That, that, that's why we, we allowed a statement to make that point. It wasn't a petition. But, but I, I think the point is made that, that uh, having looked at LAM1, it, it is... L -L -A -1, yes. Yes, yeah, that, that's paragraph 1.1.1. 1 .1 .1. uh, LAM1 and LA. Uh, talks about character and appearance. It's very much a subjective issue. I entirely accept that, but I, I don't think I agree that it will have the detrimental impact that, uh, or intrusive uh, impact when weighed against the, uh, the, the benefits. Uh, any further debate, or should we vote on that? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, so picking up on, on Steve's you know, points there, what we have to balance in the planning balance is the demonstrated risk a one in 200 year event is what this wall is there to do. This wall hasn't even got a 200 year life in it. It's a 100 year wall for a 200 year event. So we've got to get some things in perspective here. And the 200 year event could happen next year. I mean, you know, fair enough, you know, it's, it, it could happen next week, who knows? And, you know, it's, there's no element of climate change denial in any of this. However, we have to look at what we are losing and the planning argument is special landscape value. 5,000 ton of concrete does not enhance anything, ever. Again, I, I don't wish to correct some jury members. One in 200 year event um, doesn't mean what it seems to say. And I've, we, we've explored this with the experts. It doesn't mean it's gonna happen once in 200 years. It's a descriptor of severity, which, um, uh, which is thrown us all when they say things like that. Because, and even if, even if it were now, being discussed as one in 200 year event, which is not the change in the terminology to talk about a, a 0.5 uh, prevalence or, or what have you. Even if it was one in 200, it isn't. It isn't happening one every 200 years, and that's the effect of climate change. It's happening every, you know, five or six years or, or more, more regularly than that, even. Major, it, it isn't at West Kirby, is it? But that's a point in question. No, Chair, I've moved. It's been seconded. If you want to put it to the vote now. Okay. Happy to vote. So um, we have a, um, a motion to refuse. So voting will be for or against um, the motion to refuse. Can I see those in favour, please? One, two. And those against? One, two, three, four, five. And that's lost. So that's very clearly lost. Uh, on the basis of that, then, I will move approval um, with the conditions as listed. Is that second? Second that, Chair, given the way I've spoken in a debate. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to... The, 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 the question, the, the, the question, the, I think the objective is about whether our cut and paste function is, is working adequately in our reports. I'll just, just ask the summary of decision. Yeah, um, I think cut, cut and paste has worked probably a little too well, uh, Chair. The uh, summary of decision is paragraph or section 11 in your report. Okay, so that, that goes through the reasons by which your officers um, have recommended that the scheme should be supported. And it goes through all of the matters that we've uh, discussed in the report and covered um, covered here. Um, obviously, in part, taking part of, or taking that decision into account, you're also considering the three addendums that have been um, sort of presented to you, but that hasn't altered or required us to alter the summary of decision. You'll then note there's two paragraphs uh, called summary of decision that follow that. That's um, a, that is a section that normally appears on a decision notice. So, um, but it doesn't add anything to the summary of the actual decision in the report. So I would refer members to section 11 for the summary of the, the decision. Um, but the, just to clarify what you're uh, being asked to vote on, which is um, the recommendation to approve with the conditions as listed in the report. And we're not uh, proposing any amendments to those conditions. Okay, the conditions are as listed. There's nothing new arising. Okay. It's, uh, Steve seconded that. Any debate on further? No, we've covered this. Okay, so have a recommendation to approve. Voting will be for or against that recommendation. Can I see those in favour of approval, please? One, two, three, five. And those against? That application has been approved. Um, that concludes all the business that we have for this meeting, and I'll declare the meeting closed and end the webcast.